Hello, everybody in the IOTSA community. Thank you very much for joining us for our next edition of the Secure Connections podcast. My name is Ryan Morris, and I will be your host and interviewer through today's session. Today, I am very happy to welcome in a new guest and uh, get some insights and opinions from a practitioner's point of view, somebody who lives and does this stuff every single day. Uh, we're, we're very glad to be joined today by Art Gross. Art is the CEO of Breach Secure Now and in Skyber. And uh, we're going to learn a lot about what his point of view is on cybersecurity, on cybersecurity insurance, and on the operating side of the business of technology and security. So Art, welcome in. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks, Ryan. It's great to be here. I am uh, thrilled to to uh, you know get to talk about this, and uh, you know I always enjoy talking to the IOSA community. In fact, I was on a a, um, a the expo yesterday, and we had a great great attendance, and great feedback. People were um, hitting me up on LinkedIn and telling me how good the show was, and so I it's always a great great uh, you know turnout and a lot of good vendors and a lot of good discussion. So, excellent. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Glad that you can join in. And I will say, I'll echo your uh, your experience there. Uh, there's, a, there's a natural combination of really good and valuable educational content that's provided and an interactive community here in the IOTSA world. Uh, not just a passive audience that listens, but we love to hear from all of the listeners, get questions and comments and feedback. So, Anybody who's listening in today, uh, if you hear something that we're talking about that you are uh, fascinated by and that you think is interesting and worthy of a comment, please let us know. You can get us on social. You can reach us on the IOTSA website. All of these things are available to keep the conversation going. Uh, so before we dive into the formal stuff, Art, I'd love to know just from your point of view, how did you get into the business of cybersecurity? How long have you been doing this stuff and what was your path? into this little niche corner of the technology world? Great, good question, good question. I, you know, uh, uh, people may know this, may not know this, but I've run an MSP for 21 years and I still own that MSP. So I totally understand the MSP market. I totally understand the challenges. I totally understand what SMB clients are all about. And the way I got into this was in um, 2009, with uh, the, the when we were coming out of the recession and there was whole meaningful use and 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 really about healthcare, um, I started to build a service called HIPAA Secure Now because I have I for my MSP we have lots of healthcare clients so try to help them with their HIPAA compliance and what I realized is you know I could help a lot more organizations with HIPAA compliance and we started to build HIPAA Secure Now and you know what they say when you build something good they'll come. No one came. <laughs> I couldn't sell HIPAA, HIPAA if you, you know, giving it away back in 2009, 2010. And what I started to do is work with other MSPs, you know, work through the channel and help them with their clients. And as we started to do that, we started to grow. And you know, we, we started to build a channel program. And a lot of our partners said, we really like what you're doing, but I have non-healthcare clients. Can you help us? And I, I said, no, no, no. And then eventually I said, yes. And then we built Breach Secure Now. Um, that was 2014, 15, and now we're almost at 2,000 partners. And you know, we focus on cybersecurity. We still are very healthcare specific. Um, and I just started started a cyber insurance company, which is in Skyber. Actually, it's an insurance company for MSPs. So, so uh, yes, I have four businesses. Um, I've dealt with MSPs for you know, I worked with MSPs for the last. 11 years. I've been an MSP for 21 years. So I think I have a kind of a unique perspective, um, but it's been a great ride. I, I love it. And see, I, I would agree with the perspective. It's a, it's one thing when somebody has a great piece of software, they can sell to an MSP and they think that it will help them. It's another thing to be an MSP and know what the challenges are every day, operationally and from a technology point of view. And then to just build something to solve that problem, right? Uh, I, I, I am I am very impressed by your business development journey, right? So many times in our industry, engineers design products because they can and because they think they're cool. And we add another 11 team features to a software release because we think that that's what's interesting. 
as opposed to what you've done, the market has a need and there are people who are clamoring to solve a problem. And then we respond with a product that actually solves that problem. So much Thank more you. meaningful <laughs> when it's actually based on customer needs as opposed to just what software developers think is interesting. Exactly, exactly. And then you still want all those other features too once you start building the platform because everyone says, yes, I like this. Now I want the 11 teen, uh, <laughs> features that, that, you know, that'll make it really better. So Absolutely. Uh, yeah, one, one does not get to be a software developer casually. It, it, is, it is one of the things in our industry that is the most all-encompassing because no matter how good your stuff is today, it will change tomorrow because the world continues to change. You know, as we, as we get into the world of cybersecurity these days, I, I'm, I'm fascinated to hear from your point of view how, how we got to where we are. Because like you said, in 2009, cybersecurity is not new. We've been doing this for a while. But in 2006, 7, 8, we kind of had to twist people's arms to take it seriously. Right. Uh, 2009, HIPAA was a substantial regulation and a real advancement for privacy and data protection in an important industry. And you had to beg people to take it seriously. Yep. Fast forward to today, the evening news in the non-technical segments, right? Like actual people who run restaurants and they, they work in insurance and in law and in every other industry, now they're aware of cybersecurity as well. Yep. Yep. How did we get to this point? And what do you think that means about like how we respond to things today? You know, we used to talk back, you know, back before HIPAA, we used to talk about cybersecurity. You know, we would sell firewalls and antivirus. And in fact, you know, to date myself, I used to send texts to update antivirus definitions. You know, you actually used to have to go and do that. So, but we used to talk about it and, you know, hackers could get in and, and, you know, we were talking about FUD, right? We really with fear, uncertainty and doubt because back then it really wasn't happening. It could happen. Right. And, you know, and, and we tried to get clients to, to worry about it and to, you know, to buy our cybersecurity solutions or our, our managed service solutions. HIPAA moved us forward, but HIPAA moved us forward from a compliance point of view. Right. You know, OK, I need to check boxes. I need to you know, make sure we're training our employees. I need to, to do the thing so I don't get into trouble by the government. But what you see in, in healthcare is a perfect example. They were checking boxes, but they implemented all this electronic health records, all the sensitive data. They never put the cybersecurity around it. So one day, you know, cyber criminals woke up and said, wow, all those electronic health records there. They're, this is great because it makes it so much easier than getting like a van full of, you know, paper-based records. And there wasn't that cybersecurity. So what you start to see is a lot of the industries did not take cybersecurity seriously. And until we start seeing these breaches and, you know, the attacks on healthcare, the attacks on, you know, what we're seeing now, now it's just, it's a trillion dollar industry. And, you know, it, it is bigger than the global drug trade. Right. Organized crimes in, in foreign countries using cyber, you know, um, cryptocurrencies and very little risk of actually getting caught. And so now you wake up where we are now and it's like it's a major problem. It is a major problem. And you're not putting that genie back in the in the bottle. It is. It's pretty scary, actually. But see, I agree. The fact that being a cyber criminal is a business model that is both instructive and it's good to know that that's how they're operating so that we can structure and plan to respond appropriately, right? This is not just a random actor in a basement somewhere. These are planned and coordinated, professionally managed campaigns. That's valuable to understand. Yeah. It, it's also really disappointing <laughs> that, <laughs> that we've gotten to this point in our industry where there's actually money to be made in being the bad guy. Now, I remember when I first got started in cybersecurity 25 years ago, I, I like you, right? I, I remember using the terminology sneaker net, uh, which was the network uh, that was uh, actually construed of all of the feet walking around your office, inserting three and a half inch discs to yep. update <laughs> virus definitions, right? Um, back then, 
breach was a concept, right? Like there, there once was this time and Hey, I knew somebody who knew somebody who one time actually experienced some kind of a breach, whether it was a password breach or, you know, some form of virus or malware, we had a reasonably static deck of bad things that could happen to people that we would use to create the urgency. These days, building a deck out of that is kind of a lost art form because every single week, there's another big thing that comes out. A pipeline today, a beef processing company tomorrow. Who knows what's next? I think, and I'd love to get your opinion on this because regulation seems to have some effect, not, not all of, it hasn't solved the problem, but I think it does advance the conversation. Just yesterday, I saw an article that said that the government now intends to classify cybercrime at the same level of threat and urgency as they do terrorism. Yep. Yep. Thoughts on that? Like, where do you see that going in terms of urgency and regulation? But what, what impact do you think that will have on how people think about cyber threat? I think let's start with the the last piece. I think that is more of how people start thinking about this, all right? Because for the most part, if you look at from an MSP perspective in SMBs, they've ignored this. This is not going to happen to us. This is happening to pipelines. This is happening to hospitals. It doesn't happen to small businesses. And by by saying that this is as bad as terrorism, that this is you know we need to you know beef up our cybersecurity, the 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 business owners that that potentially didn't care about it before are starting to say, this could be a threat. You know, the boards of, of large co- corporations that this is now on the news, their, their customers and their employees are going to be asking them, what are we doing for cybersecurity? So forget about the regulation, just the, the spotlight on it helps. Just knowing that this is this is everyday conversation. It isn't the one-off, like WannaCry. I was like, WannaCry happened. Everyone's going to care about you know ransomware, but that was like four years ago and no one, it didn't move the needle. Move the needle at that point, didn't move the needle. Now, if we have you know government starting to say this is a problem and we have to focus on it, I'm hoping that spotlight gets people moving. Um, you know, and and at least starting to have conversations with their IT companies, with MSPs, with their internal IT. You know, what do we need to do? Like, how much of a risk is it, and what do we need to do? And if that happens, that will move the needle. At least starting to implement basic cybersecurity hygiene. See, now that's that's exactly where I think we are in the conversation. And as an industry, we need to kind of deliberately pull ourselves forward, right? There is a there is a moment in time where the world is aware of what we're doing. They are appropriately, I think, concerned about how serious this can be. But if we just capitalize on the fear, I don't think we're going to go anywhere to solve the problem. Right. If all we do is say bad things can happen, well, I mean, a trying to scare people in a modern world is a pretty tough thing to do. We've all seen and heard some pretty scary things. And the next one that you're trying to use generally doesn't frighten me that much. But even if it did, right, if, if the industry just keeps coming out and saying it's big, it's bad, it's scary, there's, there's, there's all these bad things that could happen. And if we succeed in frightening people, I don't think that's going to cause people to proactively adopt cybersecurity solutions. I think what it will do is the terminology I use for it is it'll cause people to turtle, right? They will go right back into their protective shell. They won't reach out. They won't make proactive decisions with their technology systems. I think we need to move from fear to optimism. And I don't mean optimism in the way like it's not that bad of a thing. Everything is sunny. I mean it in the way like you just said you can actually do something about this basic hygiene tools I, from a from an optimistic point of view what do you think are the keys to actually having a cybersecurity conversation that is not just relying on fear you know and and i totally agree fear doesn't help that i mean i i think you know people say i don't like to sell fear one i'd like 
I like to think of it as you're actually reality now. Okay, we do have these crimes, these crimes, we do have these events. But more importantly, you need to educate. You need to have that small business owner relate to what you're saying. It isn't the boogeyman's coming to get you. Okay, it is. This is happening. This is how it happens. You know, and one of the things is, as MSPs, as you know, in the industry, we talk about ransomware all the time. We just use the word. We talk about data breaches. But when you really take a small business owner, they don't actually know what that means. Oh, encrypting files. They don't know the pain of not being able to get in touch with customers because your CRM is encrypted. They don't know that your phone system doesn't work, that your security system may not let you in the office. They don't know that you may not be able to sell your goods for a week. They don't know what the reputation damage. They don't know what forensics costs. So when we use ransomware, what we really have to do is peel back the layers of what it is. So that, that kind of gets the pain point. But to get to the optimism <laughs> where you wanted to go is there's a lot that we can do just to lower that risk. You know, we can train our employees. We can use multi-factor authentication. We could make sure we have, you know, a solid disaster recovery and backups. These aren't that expensive. These are, these are tangible, you know, items that you can do relatively inexpensive and it will lower the risk significantly. You know, I, no one can say you will never get breached, but if you do these basic, you know, safeguards, criminals will probably move on to someone who has it. And that's where the optimism is. It's like, let me explain to you why you need to be concerned. And let me explain to you some basic steps that you can do to protect yourself. And I think those are the conversations we need to have. See, and I love that idea of the tactic, so what, now what, yeah. right? Does it matter? Is it a big enough thing that people need to be paying attention to? And if so, can we solve the problem? That's where we haven't gone yet and where I think there's great opportunity. If we can say, yes, there are things that are happening, that's reality. But that's why you work with somebody like an MSP who is a professional. They have tools. They have continuous monitoring and services, and we can give you the confidence to actually operate in a digital world. Uh, that to me sounds, it's not just, it's not just a sales pitch, right? right? I kind of feel like we're moving into a world where if systems are not secure, that's not just the IT department's problem anymore, nope. right? We're like you were outlining, it has a fundamental impact on day-to-day -day business operations, and we'll borrow an unfortunate buzzword from our industry, right? The fact that digital transformation is actually happening and yep. all of these systems for knowledge working businesses and retail and manufacturing, all these systems are actually moving online. The digital world is the world now. And it's, you know, the physical and the digital, we, we can't operate without the other. And so, the more systems go online, the more tangible the impact becomes. I think if the world doesn't learn how to operate in a threatened world of cyber security vulnerability, if we don't learn how to operate there, we won't be able to operate at right. all. And how um, yeah. I thought, thoughts from you on that. And, and that's really where you get to like tabletop exercises or walking a client through. It's great that we put everything online, but this is what happens when there's a cyber attack. This is what happens when the data breach. So let me walk you through it. So this way we can then go from the beginning and say, how do we prevent that? You know, and how do we minimize that, that happening? And then if it does happen, what should we do? You know, so the, the cyber security in the beginning, cyber insurance at the end, you know, and then it's the, all the, you know, the MSP managing that. So I think it's really important that we start to dissect what the digital transformation risk is, by, but not just fear, but by this is what could happen. So you, you can make informed decisions, right? You know, you want to, I want you to protect yourself. I want you to spend money to do that, but I want to explain to you why you need to do this. And I think, I think educating clients on what it really means to be a breach victim, to be a ransomware victim is really, really important because this is the risk they're taking by this digital transformation. Well, and that's the thing, right? 
every business decision comes with upside and potential downside. That's why business actually happens is it's not obvious what the outcome will be if we have an open mind to what are the pros and what are the cons and we can manage our risks. Well, that's been the definition of management and strategy from the dawn of the the capitalist economy, right? We, We exist to take risks within reason if we can manage those things. I, I love your idea of walking people through the what would happen. I, I learned a long time ago that there is, if, if our goal is to get people to take us seriously as, as an industry, if we want them to believe that we can handle difficult problems that are yet to occur, that that intangible nature of it, you have to create some credibility. And the first leg of credibility is process and method. You know, the fact that we're not just figuring it out as we go, we're not just guessing at how to respond to this, but that there is structure and process and repeatability. That's the first leg of being credible in, in a, a difficult situation that has yet to occur. Right. I, I think that one's yeah. great. And, and that's, you know, as an MSP, you start to talk, talk about the business risk. You know, a lot of times I'll put on my MSP hat. I don't want to talk about breaches. I don't want to talk about the stuff because the client's going to say to me, aren't you protecting me? Don't we pay you to do this? Why? You know, and I say, this is a great opportunity to say, I have implemented this, this, and this, but it's probably one of your employees that are going to make a mistake. You know, all the technology I've put in place and all of the process, <laughs> I put all of these alarms and monitors on your house, but the employees open the door and letting the criminal in. I can't protect you from that. Okay. But if it happens, this is what could happen. This is the outcome. And this is why we need disaster recovery. This is why we need two factor authentication because if the employee makes a mistake, this will protect us from that. So, you know, in a way, you get away from that conversation. Well, I thought you were going to do this for me. I am, but I can't protect from human mistake, right? What we can do and we should do is strengthen those humans, make them firewalls and train them, but they can still make mistakes. And and business owners understand that because they have employees and anyone who's had employees have seen employee mistakes, whether or not coming to work, you know, saying something to a customer they shouldn't, that's relatable. So it's a way, it's a conversation now is let's put the technology in place. Let's put the resiliency in place. But these employees potentially could be that problem. Then that leads you towards, you know, what are all the pieces we need and how do we protect ourselves if the employee makes a mistake or if there is a stake and then we have a breach. So I, I, you know, in the past, no one ever wanted to talk about this. And because it puts the MSP in a bad light, I don't think that's the case anymore. I think, you know, as being a, a partner for a business, you know, I want to be truthful with you. This is what I can do and this is what I can't do. But this is what I want to let you at least understand the impact of, you know, what could happen. See that and, and that is, well, it's what I will refer to as job security for MSPs. Yep. No matter how advanced the systems become, no matter how rock solid we make the technology, as long as there are humans involved, there's the potential for an error or for malicious behavior. Yep. Two very different worlds, but most of the time, the breaches aren't the result of an employee doing something on purpose. It's right. usually just an accident. It's a mistake, and we have to be able to plan for those things. Um, I, I recall Years ago, when I was selling for a technology company, we sold infrastructure systems that were uh, managing data platforms and calculations, right? We were offloading data calculations from the business uh, servers. And um, when, in order to help us sell it more effectively, management thought it would be a great idea for all the salespeople. We had to spend a week on the help desk to learn how this stuff gets used and aside from like the brochure where and what the value proposition is, what actually goes wrong in the implementation? How does mistake happen? How do, how do actual breaches still occur? And and even though we know we could prevent it, it still happens. So you had to live on the help desk. And I remember 
grizzled veteran who was teaching me how to how to walk people through the resolution to uh, data availability challenges. Uh, there were classifications of things that might go wrong. There were tools systems, there were interface systems, right? all these different things. And one of them as a category he put out there, it's what he called the KTFI problem category. And, and I remember thinking, that must be very fancy. It's a it's a four letter acronym, not a three letter acronym. <laughs> it must be really important in the industry. It took you know four or five hours in the training to get to that part of the the curriculum, and I was eager. I was, what is KTFI? And he said, keyboard to floor interface. <laughs> Humans, right? Uh, no matter how well the systems are designed, the humans are still going to have a problem how without just learning from painful experience of whoops you shouldn't have done that now we have to recover how do we get the humans to be better actors in a risky digitally connected world yeah you know and it's interesting it's employee mistakes but it's not just employees mistakes because it's criminals in a trillion dollar industry socially engineering these employees to make mistakes Right. You know, employees are trusting. They they're you know, maybe they're uneducated. They are, you know, they're definitely very, very easy victims to to socially engineer phishing, phone scams, tech scams, you know, all of that. So, you know, I think the first thing that we have to do is educate those employees. Right? We have to strengthen those employees, because if you don't know of scams that could be happening, phishing or how to identify phishing emails or or what the payload of a phishing email may want. Maybe it wants your credentials, wants you to download a file, wants you to run a macro. If you don't know that, you can't protect yourself. So clearly the first thing we have to do is strengthen those humans, right? We have to make sure that we do training and simulations and, and all the things to get them aware. And, and I think that goes a long way because you know it gets back to, I need to convince the business owner that it's worth training in their employees, right? This is the negative outcome. And now this is what we can do. You know, we should be training employees. And I think that's really important. Um, you know, one of the interesting parts of like social engineering is, is when you start to talk about a trillion dollar industry, you know, these cyber criminals are hiring the brightest minds in the world, right? The best programmers, the best social, you know, people who, how do we socially engineer someone? And, and it's, it's kind of, you know, we're no longer you know, working with hackers or, you know, people with hoodies in the in, you know, parents' basement, right? We're talking about sophisticated networks going after businesses. So, you know, you really have to focus, the first piece is on, on human security and worrying about that. I mean, clearly you need all of the rest of the, the safeguards. It's not just, you know, training employees, but it, training employees has to be a part of, part of that conversation and solution. Absolutely. And to do that in, to borrow terminology, right, to, to do that in a sandboxed environment where the risk of mistake is not catastrophic, where you can make a mistake and it triggers an education opportunity as opposed to it triggered an actual breach. Exactly. That, I, I think that that's a terrific advancement from, from an industry point of view. The stakes that you're talking about are, are fascinating, right? All the very best and brightest bad guys are getting together to think of all the ways that they can attack and they might have a thousand different ways to approach. But in order for us to be successful, we have to put one single simple click on the wrong thing right. can have that significant effect. It's not like they don't have to cause a massive breach in in data access they don't they don't have to get your cfo to go rogue and disclose all of the company financials an employee clicking on a link can be all it takes for that to happen so we have to overcorrect from an from a uh, from an engineering point of view I, I mentioned earlier the idea of credibility right how do you make people take you seriously Method and process is the first thing. Uh, experience and relevant examples is the second thing. And you touched on that, like this is how we've done this before. The third leg of, of credibility, if you will, is the idea of a protection mechanism. Even if something goes wrong, 
you will be okay. In commercial terms, we talk about warranties and guarantees. And, and we know we can't guarantee the world of cybersecurity that nothing will ever, ever happen. How do we approach that leg of credibility as an industry to get people to not just believe we can solve it and that we have solved it, but even if something goes wrong, they're going to be okay. How do we solve that? Well, you know, this is interesting. That's a great, I, I totally agree with what you said, but now I actually think MSPs have to have this conversation. If something goes wrong, you know, I have backup. I have, I have some of the solutions, but ransomware data could be copied off site. They, you know, so I could restore your data. These criminals now are extorting you and threatening to release this information. I think, I think MSPs have to have the conversation. If this happens, you know, the, the, the cyber criminals are going to want to negotiate a ransom payment. I am not an expert in negotiating with criminals. I don't do that. I mean, I'm a good MSP. I don't do that. You're going to want to know what customers potentially are, you know, exposed if they release the data. I don't do digital forensics. That is a very specialized, you know, piece. You're going to need law lawyers, right? You know, wh what do we, what do we have to report? Who do we, what, how, what's the timing? What's the state's federal requirements? I, I'm not a lawyer. I, you know, it, it, customers potentially could drag your company on social media, you know, reputation damage. I can't protect your reputation, you know, and, and those pieces. So I think it's really important of what I can help you with and what I can help you with. And then that, I mean, that leads to the cyber insurance and those specialized resources. So in a way you're still educating. Okay, if this happens, this is what I put in place. This is what I can do. I can work with these other vendors, but we're gonna need these resources. And it's really important that you start to think about that. So, you know, in a way, it's not that, oh, you know, okay, you know, there's nothing we can do, but if it happens, it's going to be real. The pain's going to be real. And we need to make sure that we're prepared for this because you don't want to start Google forensics in the middle of a ransomware <laughs> breach. And you need to start talking about this. And I think that leads you to the conversations of cyber insurance and those specialized vendors, those managed security service providers, how, who do we work with? to make sure we're going to be okay and your business is going to survive this, this attack. Absolutely. See, now that's, that's where I think we can stop sounding like we're just screaming about the sky falling and start talking about how we proceed in a confident manner. I've yep. got process. I know how to prevent things with systems and with people. I have resources and tools in place in layers to protect your data and your systems infrastructure. And I have insurance that I can bring to you so that you are not concerned or even me, right? As the, as the MSP, I need to, to be insured as well so that I can make these kinds of representations so that I can confidently go forward and say, the, yes, this is difficult. Yes, this is hard work to do, but that's what the money's for. Right. Right? That's, exactly. that's exactly. why you pay professionals to do these things so that you can solve difficult challenges. We've done it before. We know how to do it again. I think that's a very big, uh, a very big thing. Insurance doesn't mean you won't get in a car accident. It just means that if you do, we can mute some of that financial exactly. and, and, and logistical pain. Insurance doesn't mean you won't have a health insurance, a health issue, but it does mean that we can help you take care of it. Insurance right. in this sense, I think that it's high time that our industry got to the level where actual financial grownups in the insurance industry can look at us and say, okay, you know what you're doing, you're doing it well enough that I'm willing to back you financially with an insurance policy. Right. How does an MSP get that level of I'm a professional and I and you can not don't just take my word for it, but I can prove it to you. How does an MSP get to that level with the insurance providers and with their customers? You know, unfortunately, it's the exact opposite. 
Okay. Insurance companies are now saying MSPs are a risk. All right. So a lot of insurance companies do no, no longer want to insure MSPs, you know, errors and omissions, cyber insurance, all of those, those, you know, policies that protect MSPs because what they're seeing is an attack on an MSP can impact 10, 20, hundreds of clients. So, you know, MSPs are a target. All right. So when, one of the things that and that's one of the reasons, you know, I, I started in Skyver, because what I'm seeing is that MSPs are struggling to be insured. You know, uh, premiums are going up, insurance companies are walking away. And so it's really important for MSPs to take their own insurance, you know, uh, seriously, because they could be attacked, just like we were talking about healthcare. MSPs are under attack also. So, you know, it, it's what, what's going to be a wake up call for a lot of MSPs is they're going to start to see either they're going to not get renewal opportunities or those renewals of policies are going to go up and significantly. And we've seen it go up, you know, 50%, 100%, 200%. So it will wow. it, become expensive to run an MSP from an insurance business. And, and you know, but you Clearly, the risk here, you can't not have insurance. So, you know, it's very important that MSPs start to educate themselves on their insurance options, their protections in case they become a victim. Just like we have those conversations with our clients, MSPs have to start having those conversations with themselves. Like, you know, what am I going to do? Am I putting the right safeguards? Do I have the right insurance? So it's, a, you know, it, it is definitely a, a troubling time to be an MSP. Well, and that's that's the thing. I, for many years, and I'm sure you've heard this and said this to your own clients, the things we do are not trivial, right? We're not just here for peripheral, nice to have reasons. The uptime of your network, the 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 availability of your data, the security and privacy of your data. These things are not just trivia; they are mission critical. Yep. Well be careful what you wish for, because as soon as your customers actually believe you that what you do is mission critical, well, now it's not optional to do it poorly. And those those raised expectations go with the stakes of, of what's at risk here. And that is what forces an industry to professionalize, yep. right? It, it's not just you know once in the meatpacking industry, it was just some guys who got together and they did some stuff. And when the stakes went up and the risk was high, regulation came in and there were professional standards that had to be adhered to. That's true in the medical industry. That's true in the, in the legal profession, in the financial profession. Historically, we've always said, oh, none of that applies to us in, in IT because we'll just figure it out. We're really smart right. people. Guess what? That's no longer good enough. I think the world has come around to the point where they actually agree what we do is important and yep. because it's important it's not okay for you to just haphazardly try hard and right. see how it goes well you know and, and that's the great opportunity because if you can prove to your clients that you have implemented the safeguards to protect your own organization that you've insured yourself that you're you it's no longer the race to the bottom on the cheapest provider the cheapest provider is probably the riskiest provider I am no exactly. longer want to be the cheapest. I want to show you the security, the cybersecurity safeguards that I've put in place, how I'm going to protect you. In fact, now when you start to negotiate on price, that is the way this, you know, if someone comes in at a, an unbelievably cheap price, that's when you say that's the risk that they're bringing. Are they putting these safeguards in place? Are they prepared in the event of a breach? So what you said is if they start believing that, then you should be charging because you are putting in those safeguards. You are that professional organization. We're not a regulated industry, right? Anyone can say they're an MSP and anyone, and it used to be a real problem for MSPs, you know, commoditization, the cheapest wins. I think cybersecurity turns the tables on that. The cheapest is the riskiest. So, you know, charge more, prove that you have secured yourself, that you have taken those, those steps and, and win business, and, you know, and, and, you know, increase profitability. See, now that, that's a fantastic way to wrap up our conversation, because I think that is the holy grail, right? We're no longer just here 
promising that our technology is cool and competing on price. We are investing in actual professional capabilities and appropriately charging for the value. I've been an outspoken critic for 20 plus years in our industry of the dangers of discount selling and how that's that's just an easy crutch when we're not good at selling and we think it's the only way to actually make it happen. Boy, I think it is high time that our industry learns once and for all, the best lawyers are not the cheapest lawyers. The best accountants cost extra. The best doctors do things that are really, really important and highly risky, and therefore they are very highly compensated. It's about time that we start to believe in our own value and sell without resorting to discounts. So absolutely, boy, and cybersecurity is a great opportunity. You know, it's really as we you know to to go full circle as we hear more and more, more about ransomware. This is the time now to start selling towards that you know you're hearing about it these are the this is why my msp you know is the best partner for you this is why we're better than a lower price competitor and, absolutely and um it's good stuff that is that is very good stuff because boy could we use some uh, some some good news on the the revenue and profit improvement side of our industry as well not just cool new products to sell but ways to run our business more profitably. Excellent information. Uh, so let's wrap it up with uh, with some practical steps then. Uh, if someone's listening in and they are curious about the idea of cyber insurance, if they're curious about the structured approach, what steps can they take? Where would you send them to look for some additional information? Yep. Well, you know, MSPs definitely have to focus on their own their own insurance. So, so there, there's, you know, specialized MSPs, you know, we started in Skyber, we can definitely help you, but there's lots of other vendors as well. You know, make sure that you have the right policies, that you have the right coverage, make sure that you're protected if you become a ransomware victim, because it could literally kill your business. So you want to make sure that you have that coverage. The other piece is cyber, secu- cyber insurance for your clients. With these, these insurance companies are now saying, okay, we'll insure SMBs, we'll insure businesses, but we want to see cybersecurity safeguards put in place, which is great for an MSP. If you start to have that conversation and you convince a client that they should look at, at its cyber insurance, the cyber insurance carrier is going to make sure that cybersecurity is implemented. They're going to help you. And, and so now those are the conversations you want to start to have with your clients about the risk, walk them through what's happening with ransomware, and then why you need cyber insurance. Because when they go to fill out that app, they're going to say, have you implemented employee training, multi-factor authentication, disaster recovery, a SOC, you know, all of this password controls. It's like they're finally going to push your client that you may have had trouble getting to believe they need to implement cybersecurity to do that if they want that coverage. So it's a, you know, focus on your own insurance to begin with, and then also start having these conversations with your clients because that those insurance carriers will help you with your cybersecurity message. Absolutely, that is excellent advice. Art, uh, th- this conversation is really good and practical. I love that we're able to give folks some, some hands-on information. If, uh, if they want to find you out there in the world, uh, how do people locate you? What's the best way to uh, keep in touch with Art Gross? Yeah, well, I am, if, if you follow me on LinkedIn or Facebook, I post in all the MSP groups. I'm very active on LinkedIn. So social media is a great way to connect with me and love having dialogues. Um, as I said, I'm the CEO of Breach Secure Now. You can send an email to me at artg at breachsecurenow.com. I'm also the CEO of Inskyber. We can definitely help MSPs with, with their, their insurance needs and their clients' insurance needs. So just, just reach out to me and I'd be more than happy to give you insight from an MSP, cybersecurity vendor, or from an insurance perspective. Excellent. Thank you very much, Art. And for all of you listening in, please, let's keep this conversation going because I think we are on to some really good and practical ways for you to not just solve cybersecurity problems, but to run a profitable business 
solving those problems as well. So please let us know how we can further this conversation and help you guys solve the business and the technical challenges. Uh, reach out to us at the IOTSA website, get, get in touch with us on LinkedIn or any of the other social platforms where you will see this information, but please keep the conversation going. Thank you everybody for joining in on today's session. Thank you.